Here we are in Luxembourg. You've been here for 10 days. How does it feel after this long stretch of time uh, with the pandemic surrounding you? You've been in a state of siege, but with the pandemic around you and not a political situation such as we knew under apartheid, how does it feel being out of it? How does it feel being in it, and how does it feel being out of it? Well, let's first talk about being out of it. So it's, it's been remarkable generosity on the part of Mudam, on behalf of the Grand Theatre, the whole of the Red Bridge project, to bring the company, not just me, but performers, composers, dancers, singers, for five different projects into Luxembourg. And it meant that for the last 10 days, there have been between 15 and 25 friends and collaborators together in the same hotel doing different projects, which is kind of inconceivable, has been inconceivable for the last 15 months, even though we live in Johannesburg, most of us quite close to each other, to gather in this number and to have the conversation, the late night conversations, all right, breaking the curfew on the hotel terrace, um, all of those things. So on the one hand, that's felt extremely open. I'm also aware of this as a much more law-abiding uh, and diligent community than we used to in Johannesburg in the sense of everybody is wearing their masks. No one has their masks under, under here. There are all these good gaps between the theater. We're in a sold out performance with 80% empty seats. I mean, that's why you have very, very low infections, I'm sure, and it's been well done. But so, ironically, in Johannesburg, where we haven't really yet had vaccinations on a large scale and where, um, where there's much less control of what's happening with COVID, restaurants have been open, um, there have been performances with small audiences um, for a while. In the studio, because most of the people in the studio had COVID, last year, we were in a kind of post-COVID situation. When everybody's had it, then you don't need to be social distance and with masks and all of these protocols. So in fact, for most of the year, it's been a kind of open studio, 20 of us having lunch together every day in the garden. Um, so in one sense, it feels more closed down here in the day-to-day -day controls and but it's been astonishing within that to have this gathering of all the people together. I mean, I'm sure we can talk about the, the not the ironies, the paradoxes of the, of, the, uh, of the pandemic. And as a visual artist, where I have the studio in the garden, even in the most extreme lockdown circumstances, it was possible to keep doing my work. It was more than possible. It was a pleasure. Every performance and exhibition was either cancelled or postponed. And so instead of having usually the five or six or eight trips to different institutions a year, there were none. So I've had 15 months at work in my studio. And I've never had, I haven't had that for 45 years. You refer to this as a sabbatical. It's a kind of sabbatical. It's a kind of, so from, I'm aware that from a, you know, pro, uh, a selfish point of view, what, what was possible for me, it was a kind of a blessing. But at the same time, I'm completely aware that for many of friends and colleagues and collaborators who are in musicians or dancers or performers, <coughs> it's been calamitous. It's been calamitous, not only in that there was no income because of all the cancelled projects, but many people were not able to practice their métier. They weren't able to practice as a dancer, as a musician. The studios were shut. They were isolated on their own. They weren't with a group of performers that they need to be with. And so I think for, I'm aware of the ease of me saying yes, for me it was an easy time and aware of how desperate it was and still is for many, many people that I work with very closely. William, just going off slightly at a tangent, here in this wonderful exhibition at this museum, at the Midam, there is more sweetly play the dance. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, some of the characters in the procession were actually inspired by the news of the Ebola outbreak. Am I right? Yes, there were more than just the news of them, but the images of them. Yes, yes. And that was the first time we saw this high-tech 
uh, high-tech medical costuming, which one's used to seeing in an emergency room or an intensive care, out in the world. People with these hazmat suits with plastic visors and beekeeper-like suits around them, leading people with trip sets around hospitals. So this was in 2015, I think, 14, 15, or 16 in West Africa, which it was an epidemic that in the end was restricted to West Africa, but sort of startled, started alerting the world to the sense of this mortality that was around, these dangers that were about. So in retrospect, yes, that film is about plague, about um, epidemic, even though it's not this, but it was made a couple of years before our current, current crisis, so it's to Suzanne's credit that she had the prescience to say this will be a key work in this exhibition which was planned in the months before the start of the epidemic. The reason I mentioned Banksy is because I am constantly astounded not only by your originality and inventiveness but at the same time by your constant awareness of what other people have done before you and how that previous artistic activity might enter your work. And you gave me an, one more example of this this morning because among all the phrases that are reproduced in one of the films upstairs, which is the film with the oak leaves? The, Waiting for the Sibyl. It's called, Waiting the film for, is called Waiting, Waiting for the, for the Sibyl. Excuse me. And one of the phrases is something about insects with moustaches. What's the exact phrase? Beware of insects with moustaches. Beware of insects with moustaches. And I said, to, I was standing with William watching this film, and I said, where does that one, where did you get that? And you answered. Well, the phrase, be, the, beware of insects with moustaches, did strike me. The text of Waiting for the Sibyl, both the film and the kind of libretto for the chamber opera that's at the Grand Theatre, um, is a mixture of Sutu proverbs, um, Twana proverbs, should I say that. I found phrases that I've written, and a lot of lines that come from different poets in translation. They're all, none of them are English poets, in fact. Um, sometimes transformed, sometimes as they are. And there was a Yevtushenko poem which had this line about insects with moustaches. And that kind of thought, what can that mean? And then it was explained to me that in the 1970s and 80s. One of the ways of controlling dissidents in the Soviet Union was to have them consigned to mental institutions as being not politically dissident, but as being crazy. And one of the questions that psychiatrists, military psychiatrists, or police psychiatrists asked detainees to make this assertion that you were crazy was, do you see insects with moustaches? And there's no answer, I think, if you did see them, you were crazy, or if you didn't see them, you were crazy. Most probably either answer was enough to have you certified. Um, but that's where that, that phrase, the phrase came. It's kind of just enough of a strange phrase to try to imagine a kind of either a caterpillar with a moustache or a beetle that's got a kind of moustache. It's like Gogol, it suddenly makes, or like um, Kafka, uh, George Samsa who gets turned into a cockroach and maybe still retains his most probably wispy moustache he'd had before. I can't help going off at a tangent again. I remember when we were students, I'm not, we, William and I were not at university together, though we went to the same university. Um, I remember when we were students that those of us who were particularly interested in poetry were reading almost anything but English-speaking poetry and certainly not very much South African poetry. And you've just said that most of the extracts you've taken were from non-English-speaking poets. Why should that be? I'm trying to think. Um, there's some, uh, there is something about the weight of the traditions of English language that obviously are difficult for me, in the sense of almost every project I've done, whether it's uh, the Zauberflöte or Lulu or Wozzeck or Ubu or Memorias Postumas to Braskubas or Confessions of Zeno, are all writers not writing in English initially, all in translation. 
uh, La Vie d'un Boy, the great Cameroonian novel, another case in point. And I'd never constantly made a decision for that, but just in retrospect, if I look back, they're all from, there's something about the dislocation that happens in translation, which for me unlocks more possibilities. Um, that the imperfection of translation, the fact that it's one of many possible ways of thinking about it. Your original text is a given, that's not going to change. If you read a Rilke poem, the Rilke poem stays the Rilke poem in German, but there are so many different, there's a whole book about the different translations of that poem. And when you connect to one of those, you understand it's something in you that links to that translation, that talks to you. And there is obviously a, an important connection between the original and its translation, but it's not the same thing at all. I mean, as they say, you know, pain and Schwarzbrot are not the same object when you eat them. Not at all. Not at all. Um, is it also that in the suffocating atmosphere of South Africa when we were studying there, we needed to get as far away from that language, anything to do with the British culture. We needed, we needed to breathe somewhere and this, this foreign, these foreign sources were part of our oxygen. Does that thought make any sense it to you? Makes, it makes a lot of thought. I, I mean, I think it was for me one of the great revelations was understanding that English positivist philosophy of taking facts as facts was not the only way of understanding the world. So when it started, in my case, it was the 1970s, the German Marxists were the alternative, the new way of thinking about the world. The sudden way of understanding the world as process, the world as transformation, the world not as fact, but facts as one moment in a series of transformations, was a, a revelation. To have uh, the kind of openness to play with form that one found either in Gogol short stories or in Machado de Assis was kind of a, a revelation compared to the traditions of English literature of Dickens and the great English novels, which were so very different. Much as I loved those English novels, they were never something that made me think this is something I want to work with or is connected to my work. I mean, I love, I love watching sport on television, but I don't expect it to be nourishing of the other work that's done. It was a bit like that with English literature. <laughs> Actually, it's, I think that of all the countries outside South Africa, France really has a special status for you, perhaps ever since the Jacques Lecoq Mime School, and perhaps the French language with it. Is that possible? Well, of, the, of all the languages which aren't English, that's certainly the one that I can, that I, that I feel I can understand with the most facility, and the one I feel least embarrassed about massacring as I, as I speak it. But it also, I think you have particular moments. So this was a period of, um, I suppose, how old Anne and I were 25 when we went to Paris in 1980. A whole new world also of thinking about what art was coming through the rigors of the training at the Jacques Lecoq Theatre School, which still for me is the bedrock of what I've learned about drawing, filmmaking, theatre making. Um, you know, the particular experiences you have either as an adolescent or a young adult or a child, which even I think, God, it's now 40 years since I was there. Surely I must have learned something new. And then part of you says, no, what you learned then was what you've got. That's where you're going to work from. So yes, there's a very close sense of this image of what, we, of what, of what it was to be in France at that era and at that, at that age, which stays with me. So if I'm in France now, there's part of me that still feels 25, even though 99% of the rest of me says, no, no, forget it. <laughs> That's not who you are anymore. I want to come back to the question of language just a little bit later. But before that, I was thinking, well, let's put this book on the table just for a while during this conversation. And how am I going to do that? And there was just one quote that leapt up at me. So this is you speaking in English, I'm afraid. 
And uh, the subject is more sweetly play the dance, which uh, we'd, we'd been listening, it was 2014, and we'd been listening to the music for this piece in your studio. And at the same time, you were preparing Wozzeck, so you, there was Alban Berg's music around as well. And in this little extract, you start off talking about the tuba, which is played in more sweetly play the dance. And this is what you say. What is it in those low notes of the tuba that reaches one's soul so deeply? Because it's not just the notes by themselves, it's obviously how a note comes after the note before it, before the note after it, the soundtrack of the other people around it, but it reaches a deep point of satisfaction, which is obviously what Berg is completely trying to avoid. All the composers from the atonal school are trying to avoid the comfort which comes with the resolution of a chord, developing a 12-tone system to say, the world is no longer so amenable. And taking this to mathematical extremes with the rigorous working out of the 12-tone system, whereas with the brass band, musically, we are still in a world of hope. We are still in a world of possibility. So here we have these two different kinds of music, these two visions of the world. Um, would you say that the friction between the two of them is central to your work? I think so. I mean, in the, in the piece that you'll hear tonight that we're performing, um, um, Waiting for the Sybil, um, the composer and sometimes I spend time listening to some Stockhausen. And there's a whole piece Stimmung, which is all done on the note B flat. It's one note and variations of voices. And the way we worked with it is we would, I would, we would take one section, not me, let me say it's Nsantla who's sitting here who would do this. We would say, let's start by playing one of the many variations, which is five voices very accurately starting on B flat and doing minimal transformations. And then Nsantla would say to us, all right, you're going to copy exactly what we're hearing very accurately and it would, they would meld together the Stockhausen and, and the singers who are going to be in waiting for the Sybil. And then at a certain point, the music of the recording would be, the volume would be taken down and we'd still be in the Stockhausen world of these very closely connected voices at that note. And then gradually we would start to leave Germany and start to make our way home. And the new things would start to emerge in the voices and different rhythms and emphases and punctuations and grammar. And it became an extraordinary thing. It was not the same as Stockhausen, but it was not like saying, let's just take a traditional South African song. It was an extraordinary shift between. And in this, as an example of that tension between those two kinds of music is what's very much there in the in it, but it's important that it, that's not all that there is, that the music that we're doing in this opera and in many other pieces isn't simply that mathematical question, and that what constitutes the rest of their described as hope in what I was, what you were quoting to me, um, but for me it's like taking it out into the world, letting it walk, letting it have a place to go, um, is what the other part that happens in the in the music, um, and so I, and this, fundamentally, I think I still understand, or I think I understand what he meant when he said that. Not me, the yes, other him. Yes, I understand. Yeah. I think, uh, or at least the other me understands. But um, I wanted to come back to the question of language, as I said. Um, it seems to me that white English-speaking South Africans are among the most monolingual and monocultural people in the whole wide world, even today. And uh, here you are. Um, you not only have brought this whole wealth of 
African culture to a new kind of Kentridge surface. But in addition now, when I look on your extraordinary website and I see the rehearsals for Waiting for the Sybil, I haven't yet seen the piece, I notice once more that you're working with people who are speaking in and, and singing in other languages, African languages which you and I, when we were growing up, were not able to understand more than a couple of words of. How does this get to you now? How does, what does it do to you? How does it reach you that they, you should be working with these people who are working themselves in these other languages? It's a, it's a good and hard question, um, and I'll answer it in different ways. So one, yes, there is a kind of a shame at being so monolingual. At university, I tried to learn Sutu, Southern Sutu, and failed at it. Had a year of it and wasn't able to. So there is, there's this, and it's a, it's a residue of what it is to grow up in South Africa, so monolingual. So there is a gap, but it's both a kind of but there's a different point to, um, to understanding language and music. And maybe it is a South African childhood growing up, but listening to opera, which I did a lot in my childhood and others, and listening to other songs, there was a sense of hearing words but not understanding them, of knowing a broad arc of what an opera was, but never really needing to uh, expect to understand all the words of a soprano singing the aria of the Queen of the Night or other songs in the, in the, in the opera repertoire, whether they're in German, French or Italian. And one understands that the singers need to understand what they're singing. They need to know what words they're singing. But an audience does not. You pick it up from so many other senses. In fact, when you finally get to hear or you read the libretto of a song that's being sung or listen to the actual words, even in English, even in rock songs, even in popular music, there are many songs where you've heard the words but they don't register as a text. So I think there's a difference between what are the demands and responsibilities of the performer and of the listener. It was a, it was a, a bit like Desmond Tutu, the Archbishop was being given an honorary doctorate at Yale, as I was told by the head of Yale University. And there was a formal meal and the, uh, the provost, the chancellor of the university said to Desmond Tutu, wouldn't you like to say grace? And he did and he said a long grace, but um, he didn't say it in English. He did the grace in, I'm not sure if it was either Tswana or Zulu, and at the end, the, um, the chancellor said, okay, that was wonderful, but uh, you know, I didn't understand what you were saying. And he said, well, that doesn't matter. I wasn't talking to you, I was talking to him, who understood it. And there's a way in which um, language and music have a strange relationship between needing to have meaning and needing to not have specific meaning. So I ask Mtlantas sometimes, what are the meanings of the people, of the songs, of a line that someone is singing? And sometimes I say, well, it is a connection, but it's a distant connection to the word that's being translated to the word that we see. Um, and it's always a very poetic connection, which is vital for the, uh, for the singers. And we hear a sense in it, even if we don't understand the specifics. So it's an evasive answer because, as I say, to get back to the first point, there's a big part of me that is hiding against a kind of shame at not having an access to that, to that language. Yes, and yet, unlike a lot of artists who've come out of the same context as you, that feeling, along with all the guilt and whatever else one might put in the package, has not stopped you making this work. That's part of the miracle. Yeah, I mean, I think it no, certainly, even if you just look, the work is happening, so it's not stopped the work. And it's certainly, but it's work that is completely nourished in the this, in this space that you are describing. Um, it would be very different if you said, okay, we're only going to sing in English every once so that everybody can follow each word. It's also saying from the group of people you're working with, what is their wellspring of their either music or voice 
or text and working with that. Yes. One last question before I allow the audience to intervene here. It concerns fate. Fate was a central issue in the refusal of time, the story of Perseus who could not refuse, could not escape his fate. Here we have the oak leaves of the Sibyl, and fate is once again on the table. But you personally don't strike me as someone who's necessarily accepts that there is such a thing as fate or destiny. Am I right or am I wrong? No, you're right. You're right in the sense that, no, but what I, I understand, obviously, all the retrospectively, we can say this was your fate, this was what was going to happen. I'm intrigued by the idea of evasive action meeting the decisive strike. So as you think you're avoiding something, you're in fact going right into its path. There's the, um, the story of the death in Samara. Uh, the story of the of the merchant in Baghdad who sends his servant into the market to buy some food and the servant comes back very shaken and says, uh, Master, when I was there buying food, a person called me over to him and I went over and I saw under his cloak that it was uh, death calling to me. So I ran away and I've come back here, what must I do? And the, the uh, merchant said, Oh, um, he must hide and run. So he ran off to Samara. And later in the day, the merchant himself went out into the streets. And there again, he came across this person with his hood and realized this must be the figure of death and went to, um, to him and said, uh, what are you doing terrifying my servant? And he said, the death said to him, yes, I was a little bit surprised to see him here because I've got an appointment with him this afternoon in Samara. So that sense of heading towards it as you try to avoid it. Um, that's, that's, sort of, that's why those stories of Perseus and of the, and of, um, the, Sibyl. the Sibyl strike so, so deeply. A childhood fear of are you running into danger or away from danger? But an acceptance of that openness, of that uncertainty. <laughs>